So I want to welcome you all and thank you all for coming. Um, the Costume Society also wants to thank you today um, and for joining this in the part of our webinar series, The Conversations on Dress. And with that, I'm super excited to introduce my friend and good colleague uh, today, um, Adam McFarlane. Um, so before entering the field, Adam studied both in the United States and abroad focusing on fashion. In addition to his education, Adam freelanced and worked for the Cincinnati Art Museum before joining the Missouri Historical Society, which is the collection we're going to be talking about today. This collection spans over 18,000 items and is almost as old as the museum itself. These objects are divided into three collections, including the Catherine Dunham collection, which I'm super excited about. Uh, which centers on dancer Catherine Dunham, uh, the Vale Profit Collection, a collection that features a local philanthropic society and a broader historical collection. So with that, our cocktail for the evening is the Missouri Mule. And again, a big shout out to Ann Wass for the um, alcohol-free version or the virgin version, the Missouri Philly. Um, and with that, everyone, please welcome Adam McFarlane. Adam, how are you? It's good to see you. And it's, what a festive background you have. Happy yes. holidays. Happy holidays. I take Christmas very seriously. Uh, this is just one of three trees. Uh, and I will say I'm drinking, I did, I'm not much of a cocktail drinker, so I've got a Missouri made beer instead that is coffee flavored. Well, I was dashing late into traffic today, and as you know, Adam just got here seconds ago, um, and so I just have some Missouri whiskey. So we sort of, we're, whatever you all have out there, people, have it, pour it, enjoy it, maybe just some eggnog um, to celebrate this season. So, um, Adam, well, uh, I can't wait to dive in. The moment you told me that we that you have this large collection of Catherine Dunham costumes, I was just a Twitter. Um, for those of my colleagues out in the ether uh, who may or may not know, um, uh, I am a costume designer by training, and that's what I do. I also do a lot of dance, and I shared in my position here at LMU, Loyola Marymount University, um, in both the Department of Theater and the Department of Dance. So. Catherine Dunham's work has, of course, I mean, it needs no introduction. She was a phenomenal choreographer and dancer and anthropologist and you name it, um, artist um, of the 20th century. So, um, and I'm really excited to see the other things that you have to share with us, Adam. So with that, why don't we just dive into the presentation and, and as Tyrone Guthrie said, astonish us. <laughs> Thank you, Leon, for that introduction and, uh, Thank you, CSA, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, it has been an interesting year. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know, I started with uh, Missouri Historical Society back in January. So I'm still uh, not quite a year into this role. I was at the Cincinnati Art Museum before that uh, for six years as the curatorial assistant for fashion and textiles. and it has definitely been a learning curve going from a, an art museum setting to a history museum setting. Um, but like any museum, they kind of threw me in the deep end from the get go. Uh, so I've really had to learn this collection pretty quickly. And we have a very large collection of clothing and textiles that we were just doing another count to see if we could get a better idea. And it's looking like somewhere around 20,000 clothing and textile pieces. Wow. Um, and I'm ashamed to say, I know it's one of our larger collections, but I actually don't know what the total number of objects estimated in our collection is. Uh, I believe including our archives, it's over 2 million, but obviously archives do tend to be quite a bit of that um, number, um, but we are right, a pretty right. substantial collection. Uh, and it's, it is really wonderful to be a at a place where clothing and textiles is taken very seriously. Um, so what I'll start with here is the, the picture on the front uh, on this home screen here is uh, the thing that's a little bit confusing about us is that we are the Missouri Historical Society. That is the overarching body. We have three buildings. Uh, so we have the M Missouri History Museum, which is the main thing that people think of um, when they think of uh, us. 
uh, and I should say, uh, specify, we are located in St. Louis. That is, and we are not to be confused with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Uh, so there are two different entities collecting state wow. history. Uh, the uh, State Historical Society is located in Columbia. Uh, so our history museum is located here in St. Louis. Uh, and if you've ever been, we have Forest Park. It's the first thing I was told when I moved here is Forest Park is bigger than Central Park. And don't you forget that. Um, so that they're very, very proud of that, uh, as they should be. So uh, the History Museum is on the north side of the park. What you see here is the Library and Research Center, which is on the uh, west side of the park. And that is where my office is and where our clothing and textile storage and all, all of our uh, primary storage facilities are. Uh, and then we also have our Soldiers Memorial uh, Museum, which is in downtown St. Louis. Uh, and it's a fairly new part of the uh, MHS family. And so they have a separate collection, but they also do kind of uh, give and take and, and exchange with us. Uh, so what I'll be really talking about today uh, is our MHS collection. Uh, and I wanted to start with this piece. Um, and it's, uh, I don't have a huge amount of the flat textiles in here, but we do have a very large flat textile collection. Um, we have some really amazing quilts and coverlets in our collection, and we do have some art pieces as well. Uh, so I included this piece. This is the arch um, by Beth Neville of Woven Tapestry from 1964 when the arch was completed. And this is, I also wanted to include this for the imagery because one of the things that is important to note about MHS currently and where we are, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, uh, is we are the Missouri Historical Society in name. However, within the past 10 years or so, the focus has really been on collecting and exhibiting St. Louis history. So mm -hmm. it's not that we don't collect, we won't ever collect Missouri, broader Missouri history. And in fact, I, in the less than year that I've been at MHS, I've collected some quilts that are from uh, outside of uh, the St. Louis region. But primarily the focus is on St. Louis and the St. Louis metropolitan area. Uh, and that does include East St. Louis in the uh, Missouri side. And then we'll get into that when we get to Catherine Dunham. Uh, but we do have uh, a broad range of pieces uh, that really have some fun stories to them, um, but I will share because it's something that we, uh, whenever I give a storage tour, we always pull out. It was pulled out when I came to do the interview. Is a lovely crazy quilt from the, um, I believe late late 1880s, maybe early 1890s, uh, that was made for a charity auction, and it was uh, purchased by a nun uh, for the cha for the charity, and then she returned it um, to the maker. And I believe then it was passed down to her or given to her uh, brother and then given to us. Um, but it is about the craziest crazy quilt you'll ever see because it features both a taxidermied bird and a taxidermied chipmunk. And the oh my God. chipmunk is in my best guess. I don't know if we've ever actually looked close enough to confirm this, but my best guess is it's there's two of each and I believe it's one animal split in half. <laughs> Um, oh, so you have in, like they're kind of laid out side by side of uh, the chipmunk, and so it's a chipmunk that has been split in half and sewed as stuff sewed onto the crazy quilt. Wait, and so you're telling me the chipmunk is spatchcocked? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's it's a really uh, one of a, a lot of great pieces that have great stories to tell. Uh, and in this piece as, as well, uh, we also have, uh, do have some uh, things collected from the creation of the uh, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, including a hard hat uh, from 
uh, from that um, con uh, construction of the arch. Um, we do have, of course, famous people in the collections. I'm not going to go through all of them because I would have an hour plus uh, on this, but I'll do the one that everyone thinks about when they think of St. Louis. And that is Charles Lindbergh. So um, Lindbergh was, uh, uh, spent a lot of time in St. Louis flying out of the um, airport here and um, has a, a very long connection with that. So he, um, right after his 1927 flight from New York to Paris, the uh, first nonstop flight, if I remember my history correctly, uh, transatlantic flight, uh, he lent pieces to the Missouri Historical Society for display. And so they were pieces from himself. And then he received thousands of gifts uh, from anyone and everyone from uh, he received keys to cities, he received uh, personal gifts. And I've got a couple of examples of those. And then eventually, uh, you know, shortly after, um, in 1928 through the early 30s, he began donating those pieces to our permanent collection. And what's what's really amazing about it is we have a grant right now where we are uh, both cataloging and digital, uh, digitizing this entire collection for uh, an exhibition, a special in 2027, which will be the 100th anniversary of his New York to Paris flight. Uh, so we're really getting a better sense of what we have. Uh, and so it, that stuff is getting, I don't know who, if they're releasing everything online as it's being processed, but it will be all searchable on our online database uh, through our website. And we are also working on um, conservation of pieces. So uh, I should be able to get about 10 pieces of clothing and textiles conserved through this grant. Um, and it just to even to figure out what I'm what I want conserved, what's priorities. Um, our conservator, who is an objects conservator uh, on staff, gave me a list, and I believe all, somewhere between uh, 500 and 600 clothing and textile pieces alone in this collection. Wow, uh, so that's been, amazing! Oh, it, it's really that's amazing. Yeah, and, and it's, I would say the majority of it are gifts and it's, and I'll, uh, uh, in the next slide, we have a few images of uh, hand painted or hand embroidered handkerchiefs and uh, tapestries and stuff See, and from random people. They're, they're not necessarily anyone important uh, in their own rights, but just wanted to celebrate his momentous flight. Uh, so here we have, the actual flight suit that he wore on that flight. Uh, we have a couple of his flight suits, but this is the one that he wore uh, from New York to Paris. And then the sunglasses are one of my favorite pieces. And uh, we are going to be reinstalling our permanent galleries in 2024 or 2025. I, I, can't, I always get that mixed up. But um, these will be going in that exhibit for a, a fun reason is that these are, were sunglasses that were gifted to him by a doctor, and he had them on the flight from New York to Paris, and he did not wear them. And I <laughs> find that hilarious, and it's and it's wonderful because he the first day or two of the flight he didn't he forgot about them. And he was like, oh wait a minute, I've got these sunglasses. I probably should wear this. Um, and so he wore them for a little while, and then he's like, you know what? This is not working because they're too comfortable, and I'm afraid I'm going to fall asleep. So, so he wore them for maybe a little bit and then yes. took them off. Yeah, and then he was like, nope, this is, not, this is too good, too good to be true. So, uh, so I think that's, a, to me, a, a better story that he didn't wear them than it, that, uh, yeah. and why he didn't wear them. I have a uh, question about the flight suit. Yes. Is the, is the flight suit, does it zip up or is that a long button placket underneath there? Oh, gosh, I'm trying to remember. I have handled the suit, but I have not put it. I have not dressed or anything. I believe it's a zipper, but I could be 100% wrong on that. Because um, it's so, I mean, the history of the zipper is so fascinating. Let's start there. Um, and the great book called The Zipper is a great book to read. Um, but it's sort of an, uh, as I recall, it's a really, it would be a really early version of the zipper in military wear or in this right. kind of 
where it'd be pretty early for that um, or maybe right on time i just don't remember my timeline on that but yeah and I, I, I know it's in that timeline but i can't uh yeah. you'll have to forgive me that I, I also don't quite remember off the top of my head if it's uh you know within i know it's in within that 20s to 30s yeah. uh, range where okay. you start seeing more uh, well, let's move on. Oh, those are yeah. lovely. Look at those. So these are some of the commemorative pieces. And what I, I didn't purposely do this until, I, and I didn't realize this until I was, I, I chose them more for the aesthetics of them. Um, but you have one made in Brazil and one made in France. Um, and these are just one of hundreds of these commemorative, you know, cross stitch, needlepoint, uh, hand painted textiles. Uh, that were sent to him uh, over the years uh, following the, uh, his flight. Uh, and in right. the case of the needlepoint made in Brazil, I don't believe we know who made it. So we don't, I don't know if that's an American expat and stuff, but clearly it's very patriotic and celebrating, you know, America. Yeah. And so I, that, I have to wonder if it's an expat or someone that has a deep connection to the United States. Um, you know, obviously the one in France makes very perfect sense as he flew to Paris. Yeah. Oh, these are delightful. Oh, those are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and ones that I don't have pictures of, uh, but on the list to be conserved are some traditional Greenlander costumes that were gifted by the country of Greenland uh, to um, Lindbergh's wife and uh, young son. And so we have a, a woman's and child's outfits that uh, hopefully will get conserved that then we can get uh, displayed as well. Uh, so as you mentioned, the Veiled Prophet. Uh, so if you haven't heard of it, uh, you might have heard of it this summer. Uh, it was in the, new, the national news because of the actress Ellie Kemper, who is from St. Louis. And she was on the office. That's her one of her big things. Um, and it came out that she was a veiled prophet queen. And the veiled prophet is a philanthropic group. They are still active today. But in truth, in a true sense of a 19th century organization, um, as it was, it was very exclusive and meant for rich white people. And that that's just that's what it was. Um, I don't. I don't believe um, people of color were even allowed to attend as guests until the 1960s or 70s. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, it's certainly the organization has changed at, at, over time, um, but it does have that that history. And so, it came out that Ellie Kemper was part of that organization over the summer. Uh, and as it happens, we I don't have the picture of it, but we do have Ellie Kemper's queen, uh, Veiled Prophet Queen dress in the collection. Uh, she was queen in 1999. Uh, so, but I did want to pull out a few of the uh, the gowns. So the Veiled Prophet has an annual ball uh, where you have the a male figure dressed as the Veiled Prophet. It has kind of pseudo-Masonic feels to it, mm -hmm. um, but it is not a Masonic group. Um, but then they have, uh, it's kind of for debutantes, um, in, you know, so in their debut seats and oftentimes uh, you will have a queen and then they will be escorted by a special maid, uh, their special maids. Uh, so here you have two of the queen gowns in our collection, one from 1922 designed by Samuel Harbison, who was a St. Louis designer. Um, and then also the 1948 uh, queen gown done by Vera Hicks, who was also known here in St. Louis as a uh, junior wear market designer. Uh, Those are really stunning. Yeah, Those are are really stunning. stunning. The uh, the gown worn by Helen Dossier Conant, uh, like, is that a figured? Like, what is that? Is that like embroidered nets? Is um, that lace overlay? It's hard to tell in the picture what that is, or is that a woven pattern into that garment? If I remember correctly, it is appliqued and embroidered net uh, with sequin detail on it. Uh, I believe I have seen that one in person just recently. Um, and the queen dresses were generally white or uh, as they kind of, as you get into the uh, 50s and before, sometimes they'll be champagne or kind of or ivory colored uh, silver. 
and stuff, but now they generally are stark white. Um, and uh, the special maids gowns, which we'll see one of, is uh, can be different colors. Uh, here's another example um, that's more recent. We don't tend to collect as much veiled profit now, and that's largely, and I'll, I'll touch on this at the end, um, talking about our collecting initiatives, but um, we are really moving away from trying to collect not just white people, but um, and, and collecting diversity in that regard, but moving away from where, you know, being an institution that only collects rich people's stuff, because that it's not even that that's been the mission of the organization, but that's just the people that tend to think, oh, a museum might want my stuff. <laughs> Um, right. so it's right. not that we won't collect failed profit, it's, but it doesn't tend to be, uh, it's not, not our focus that we go and get the Queen's gown every year uh, as it has been done in the past, but we do still collect them uh, sometimes. So here we have the 2013 gown uh, that may Love be our most recent one. Uh, and they even historically and, and currently could be designed here locally or they could go to New York or, or uh, Paris and get the latest. Uh, we do have a pretty good collection of St. Louis made uh, pieces. So St. Louis did have a bustling fashion industry. Um, okay. So here we have this lovely um, hobble skirt gown. And I put Annie in parentheses because her label, the, the label is Cummings. And we, and this is research that was done before I got here. And I did a, a quick snippet and, I, and I'm in the same track as we don't know for certain, but we believe the woman, it is a, uh, Annie Cummings is the woman behind the, the label, but the, uh, you know, the labels in the dresses, the label as it was marketed was just Cummings. Um, but uh, that, that label did some really beautiful stuff. Um, when we redo our permanent galleries, we'll have a case dedicated to rotating through St. Louis dressmakers and designers. Oh, fantastic! Uh, this is lovely. This is really pretty. Is the is the underlayer is that uh, an embroidered gold or uh, it looks like a white gold or is that a I, print? I believe it's damask. Um, oh. I, I could be wrong. I don't believe I've looked at this one in person, um, but I believe it's a uh, figured damask um, and maybe a velvet damask. Oh um, wow! I, I could be wrong That's on that. Um, and then the other thing in the, uh, is that St. Louis had a really huge, 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 huge shoe market and shoe manufacturing here. Uh, and so it was coincidental and perhaps helped me get the job here when I was uh, at the Cincinnati Art Museum. One of the last projects I worked on was a, an exhibition on shoes from the 1950s. And as I was going through researching the makers of the shoes in that ex uh, exhibit, I started to realize that all, a lot of these shoes were made in St. Louis. And there's a really great article in 1964 in New York Times called What's in a Shoe Name? And if you, if you have access to New York Times, I encourage you to look it up um, because it's all about how difficult it is when you're looking at a shoe to know who made it because whatever is stamped on the insole is very likely not the actual manufacturer of it and may not even be the designer of it. It may be um, a retailer that is stamped inside and that retailer may or may not have manufactured or designed the shoe. Um, and so the, there's a lot that you don't always know. So Boyd Welsh on the uh, the boy, uh, shoe uh, boots on the left also produced the brand Peacock. And Peacock never on the insoles of the shoe, and rarely, particularly once you get into the 1930s and up, never advertised with Boyd Welsh in the name or St. Louis in the name. You just have to know that Pe Peacock shoes is a brand name uh, uh, produced by Boyd Welsh here in St. Louis. Um, and so that is something we, I'm still working on building that collection a little bit more. We have three or four brands that are really well represented, um, such as Hamilton or Swope, um, but there's still quite a few brands uh, 
uh, like valley shoes um, that we still need to get in our collection. Uh, but we do have a pretty good selection of St. Louis made shoes. Those swoop <laughs> shoes are stunning. Oh, yeah. So the, like, yummy, yummy, yummy. <laughs> yes, the, the heyday really was the uh, turn of the uh, 20th century up through the 1950s. And that really was, so particularly in 20s, in, in my opinion, uh, really ha has some spectacular shoes made here in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, Leon, your favorite. You're such a tease, Adam. You're such a tease. <laughs> so um, I will have to admit an embarrassing fact is I'm a huge dance fan, and I had not heard about Catherine Dunham. I, had, I think I had heard around her. I just didn't know the name. I know her work, just didn't know her name. Um, so I'm ashamed to know that I, you know, that, uh, but, but it was thrilled when I have, as I've been learning more about her and we have a huge collection of her. Uh, so wow. anyone who doesn't know, she uh, was born in the Chicago area, um, went down to university in Southern Illinois, uh, and it ended up in uh, East St. Louis and is instrumental in bringing kind of Afro-Caribbean style of dance. She, as, as Leon said at the beginning, she was a trained anthropologist. So she actually spent time in Haiti doing field research um, and, and really brought these dances to uh, international audiences. And she uh, married John Pratt and he designed most of the, the costumes for that. So um, it really is a fascinating thing. And we have over a thousand clothing and textile pieces in this collection alone. Um, so I wanted to highlight a few of them. So here's a portrait of Catherine Dunham that we have in the collection painted by Vanna Phillip. Um, and just, you know, absolutely stunning woman as, as, she, as she was um, and really embraced that style in, in her life. Uh, so here we have um, costumes from Haitian Roadside in 1946. And uh, Pat oh, wow. would design these, uh, create them, and then they would get used pretty much in perpetuity. Um, so, um, you know, we don't even know how long they were used because they were just used and used and used whenever they traveled and did these performances. Um, is that second dress completely quilted, like a crazy yes. quilt? Oh, it's it fantastic. is indeed. Um, and I don't remember, I've not, I've seen some of the pictures. I had hoped to have some of the pictures from the performances in there, because we do have um, a decent uh, archival collection as well, uh, including photographs. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the ability uh, to get those digitized in time. Um, but I do, um, you know, these focused again uh, on Haitian um, kind of Haitian village life and using traditional Creole dance mm -hmm. uh, styles. We have Tropics here from 1937. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, just oh, the made... bodice on this on the side one on the black and cream and yellow one is fantastic. Those sleeves yeah. and that neckline, that's just amazing. Look at those. And what's really fascinating, because, I mean, again, these are dance costumes. So on the left with the yellow costume, uh, she has separate uh, shorts that are underneath there so that they are movable. You're not going to be inappropriate or, you know, risk sharing something you don't want to share uh, with the audience. And so, that you know, they really took practicality into that. Um, in, in how they moved uh, as well. Um, so while most of the performances and choreography that they did was really focused on Afro-Caribbean dances, jazz was another big thing. And so um, you have this 1938 costume from Cakewalk. That's definitely a, a far different cry from what we've seen in the yeah. others. It's uh, using traditional Western uh, dress to create something sultry. Um, this one is one of my favorites. These are pieces from Tremonisha, which was the failed opera from Scott Joplin, who was a St. Louis native. Um, the uh, 
One on the right is currently on display and actually we have three different versions of the bear costume. Um, the one on the left, we have a version, another version of this dress on display currently in our St. Louis Sound exhibit, which is on St. Louis music history. Um, and one of the things that's funny and Leon, you'll appreciate if you, if you were to come to St. Louis and see this, you would not be able to unsee this. This one photographed here is stunningly gorgeous on the left. The one on display currently, we don't know why, one of the sleeves is missing a tear. Um, it's with this two tier oh. We have no clue why, and it's the most annoying thing ever to, you know, you just want to go and fix it. Um, what is the what is the trim the, on the floral dress on on uh, uh, what is the trim on it? Is it like a, a fringe braid? Yes. It's a fringe braid, just a very soft, um, yeah. I think silk silk or cotton fringe. And the bear costume's amazing. Like, is the yes. is that is there a headpiece that goes with that, or is it just uh, this costume? There's not a headpiece, but it does have, and I can't I can only see part of the the slide here. Uh, to see, but I don't think the picture has, but there are gloves that go with it. So there are full claws uh, that the hands is a little bit free underneath, and then a claw over top of it. That's the fur. Uh, right. And it has boots as well. Full. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. I have wanted to design a mascot dance for over a decade. And lo and behold, Catherine Dunham, of course, has yes. done a bear costume before I have. Well, Damn I will it. have to send you, um, there is a, in, in the exhibit, I, and I had not seen the photograph before, there is a photograph from Tree Benicia, um, of, and you see the, the guy in the bear costume dancing, and I mean, he's up in the air, leaping. I mean, he's doing stuff, so you can, it's big, it's bulky, it's heavy, but you can move in it. Oh, no, yeah, it's, this is amazing, I love it. Well, and one of the things that is so often, you know, um, that Catherine Dunham did within her, uh, her her work as an anthropologist, but also as a choreographer, you know, she developed an, the Catherine Dunham technique, which in many ways codifies um, the technique of these um, indigenous dances. And so, so oftentimes in the dance community or from people outside of the dance community, there's commentary about, well, those sorts of dances are freeform dances. There's no technique to them in comparison right. to something like ballet, uh, which is a very technique specific kind of dance. But Catherine Dunham developed the technique and revealed to the world that there is amazing kinds of technique in terms of the body control, the movement, the breath, the connection to the floor, all of that sort of stuff. So. Yeah. So she, she completely, so these are fantastic things to see within that body of work. Well, I and, love this shawl, my God, what yes. is that? And I and I don't, I've not seen the shawl in person, so I, I can't speak to it. Uh, two things I did want to point out real quick. One is Google, uh, you, go on YouTube and look up Dunham Technique, because it really is fascinating to see this combination of this African um, sense of movement mm -hmm. with, ballet technique in uh, kind of combined. And it really reminds me of Martha Graham and her, this idea of contraction uh, of the body. So she's really um, creating something fantastic that is still used and taught today. Um, mm -hmm. And I did see, I, I can't always see questions, but I did see one question come in about why we, uh, why did we use the the misshapen uh, or the uh, dress with the, the uh, missing sleeve uh, component and the answer is that this exhibition actually runs for 18 months uh, so we have multiple rotations oh. uh, so uh, because we're doing six month rotations uh for the for our pieces that are permanent collection gotcha but, so this uh, are amazing i love this dress yes and so and i'm again because i couldn't digitize it in time i had a, a i tried to and i had a an old you know a scan of a photograph of a print on a paper and so i tried to scan it but we do have a beautiful picture of katherine dunham wearing this particular uh, dress uh, in our coffee um and so yeah it's a really really stunning piece um here cabin in the sky i'm going to keep moving because i have quite a bit to get through and we're running low time okay. i do want to say we do have men's ensembles uh so oh, here we fantastic. have um a piece within a piece. So this is from uh, Afrique du Nord, uh, 
from the show Bamboche. Um, and she did play on that, like in this case, North Africa. Um, and so in the French, you know, the, therefore the French colonial aspects um, played into that, uh, even with the titling of yeah. it. Um, we do have accessories. So here's a bracelet from the show Batucada. Uh, oh, that's stunning. What's great is if you if you have it with you, it really makes, you know, all these uh, sequins and stuff make noise. So it really is about the movement, the glistening of the, this iridescent. So, every, you know, every part of her, uh, the dance ensembles, um, really played into it. We do have hats, we have wigs. Uh, we have one of our largest pieces is one of the backdrops. Um, uh, so we have oh, an entire- wow. we, have, we have a backdrop? We have a backdrop. Oh. I, for, I forget which performance it is, but we do have an entire backdrop. I'm coming to visit you, Adam. I'm coming to yes. visit. Um, so the other thing that uh, happened since I started here was a research inquiry from a librarian in Nice, France. And she inquired about this collage by Henri Matisse, uh, which is a portrait of Catherine Dunham that he did when she was traveling through Nice uh, in 1950. And she wanted to know if we have the dress in the collection. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, oh, hold please. Yeah. I okay, so you shared this to me when we in some of our preliminary meetings, but you didn't you told me this story, but you did not share the image. Uh -huh. um, image. And so, now that I'm seeing the Matisse image, I'm like, this is so awesome. Yes. <laughs> do we have the dance? Do you have the dress of this collage? That's yeah. awesome. I love that. I know. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. What might that be? What yeah. might that be? So, uh, and, the, and the difficult part as well, in addition to what you see on the screen, and as difficult as that already is, is this collection still needs a lot of work in processing. Uh, so we have maybe 10 or 15%, we know what productions they went to. So that means mm -hmm. these several hundred pieces that we don't know when it was made, where it was made, what it was used in. So what, you know, what do you do? What, what do I do if I get an inquiry about this? So what I did is what any curator would do is like, okay, well, what can I figure out from this uh, portrait? And I said, feathers. I'm gonna assume these are feathers. And this is what I came up with. So, oh. I have no idea. Maybe that's wow. it. We know nothing Maybe. about it. I don't, uh, and uh, the, we haven't heard back from the library and this was back in the late spring or the summer. She may have gotten pulled off to other tasks, but uh, we don't have any, as far as we're aware, don't have any photographs specifically of her, of Catherine Dunham in Nice. Um, so we're hoping that maybe uh, the librarian there can can do that. But um, yeah, this is as close as from our physical collection that we could get. You know, we won't. We the reality is we likely never will know um, for sure. Um, because uh, again, it's Matisse, and he is not known for his detailed portraiture of clothing items. Uh, detailed he, portraiture, period. <laughs> right, and so we, you know, we don't know what creative liberties he even took um, with, you know, what that, what those blue pieces could be, or was it a right. dress, or was it a leotard, or. Uh, what yes exactly there's the, the the sky is literally the limit on this one yeah. you know you yeah. have to go through your entire collection um do you have photographs of the entire collection of the entire dunham collection um a decent amount of it they are mostly reference photos which we don't have published online um, right. but uh this one did had you know the, the joys of you know being frank about the way museums work anyone on this uh, that's attending today that works at a museum will know that <laughs> is reference photos can be really helpful and cannot be. And this one, I actually took this reference photo on a mannequin because it did have a reference photo, but it was kind of like someone threw it on the floor 
uh, or on a table in a wad and took a picture of it. And so yeah. it really wasn't shaped in any way that could make sense of it. Um, so, and I, it, this one is extremely fragile. Um, you can e even see in this photograph some light tears. It's a very thin mesh. Um, yeah. And I don't have a picture on the back, but I, if I remember correctly, the it's very scandalous because the back actually scoops upward. So you kind of have an upward arc uh, on the hem of the skirt oh, in the back. Oh, interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, you can see through the legs. The, the, yeah. the feathers do not carry across in a across. circular manner. Yeah. They, the feathers uh, disappear. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, some, so interesting things. Maybe at some point that librarian will come back to us and find a newspaper clipping or something uh, there that gives us a little bit more hint of what she might have worn. Uh, so I want to talk about our collecting initiatives because that's a really important part about what we're doing now. Uh, so we have um, an, our Gateway to Pride collecting initiative, which is our LGBTQIA plus collecting initiative. Um, and we are uh, curator of civic and personal identity. Uh, I love the MHS, but sometimes our curators have really difficult titles. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, um, so our curator of civic and personal identity who uh, has a, a much broader scope in that she is in charge of this collecting initiative and we have a dedicated uh, curatorial assistant for this uh, initiative uh, and they are not clothing and textile people so uh, so when I started I uh, came in and really am helping them figure out what we need uh, so right now here we have a drag ensemble um, and we're, let me tell you, I don't have pictures, but tell me, tell you about one of the ones that we're getting that we're working on is a still active, I think she's about to retire drag queen who is age 93 um, and she is uh, Bonnie, Bro uh, Bo uh, Bonnie Blake and she uh, is uh, donating uh, one of her earlier pieces, uh, drag outfits from the 1960s, uh, as well as one that she wore when she was 89, uh, that are fantastic. Um, yeah. And so we're doing really good on things. We, we have some really great drag pieces, um, motor, gay motorcycle clubs. Um, unsurprisingly to a lot of people, we have a large t-shirt collection because that is something, you know, gay pride t-shirts, gay rights, pro, you know, protest t-shirts, things like that are kind of easy to get, easy to come by. Um, so I'm really working with the curators there about how we can expand that to, to really focus on identity uh, in a more subtle way. Uh, right. So with right. the Bonnie Blake donation, um, I can't remember his, his last name, but John is the performer. Uh, and we're working through a documentarian who is creating a documentary on Bonnie. And he shared with us a beautiful clip of an interview that he's did where John talks about if, if he had been a young man today, he might have been trans because he has always felt more comfortable as Bonnie than he does as John. Uh, and in the interview, he was wearing a kind of a white silk women, probably a women's blouse and a set of pearls. And I'm like, let's collect that. Let's collect something that talks about John or Bonnie's identity as a queer man uh, and stuff. So we're working on that and, and building that collection um, as well. We have things like this, uh, Soulard is a neighborhood here in St. Louis. Uh, so we have this Soulard pride flag that was uh, made and collected in 2019. Um, uh, we also have an uh, our African American history collecting initiative. And uh, here we have uh, a Riverboat captain's hat from Kevin East, who was the first riverboat captain uh, in the area uh, in uh, 19, in the early 1990s, uh, and we also, I believe, nice jacket. You said 1990s? Yes, 1990s. Wow! I thought this hat was going to be older than that. That's amazing. Yeah. No, and it's and it's a little depressing that he, you know, and similar. We have uh, the first black. Uh, female uh, firefighter. Uh, we have her uniform, and it's a lot newer, unfortunately, than you would think. You would hope that would have been 
you know, many, many decades right. ago. And I believe hers was late 80s or early 90s. Um, right. but yeah, these are, are fairly new uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it is well worn, so it is faded and, and does have a little bit of of that uh, feeling of older. Uh, well, the fire person's uniform, let's think, you know, <laughs> it's seen some yes. things, man. <laughs> Yes, and we do have a really great firefighting collection uh, as well in general. Uh, it's not one of our official co uh, collecting initiatives, but we also do uh, are working on collecting uh, representation of disability. Uh, so here we have this uh, disability project t-shirt as well. I'm going to keep going really quickly because I just realized we're really running low on time. Uh, so fun finds. I, when I started I started to discover we have a large number of cats represented on, on our clothing and textiles. Uh, so these are just, a, and I, I was able to get them photographed. Uh, so we have these lovely buttons. Uh, we have a collection of 23 uh, shank buttons that have cats on them that are just hilarious and wonderful. These are adorable. <laughs> um, and then another one, another find was this um, late 19th, early 20th century parasol with a cat finial on it uh, wow. just absolutely stunning um and then some fun finds uh this uh foire coat in the collection that was worn by helena rubenstein uh, donated to us by her daughter uh that is one thing that as far as i can tell there's no st louis connection whatsoever or missouri connection whatsoever i don't think i'm not sure how it ended up in our collection there's no documentation to explain why but I don't care. I'm keeping it. <laughs> but it's a poiré. There you are. It's a poiré worn by Helena Rubenstein. So, uh, not going to give that up. And then we have this uh, one of, I think we have two or three uh, dresses made by uh, artist Nick Cave, who is a Missouri native and is known for more sculptural pieces and the sound suits. Um, but he, um, we do have some of these uh, clothing items that he made. Uh, new acquisitions, uh, one that just got finalized a week or two ago uh, is a collection from Grace Strobel, who is a local fashion model with Down syndrome, who is, she has uh, made a name for herself nationally. Uh, here you see her on the Today Show and she donated the dress, uh, blue dress that she is wearing there on the Today Show. Um, and uh, on the far left there, you see her modeling a dress from a company called Olivia, which is based in New York. And it, they, uh, the prints that they use are designed by people with disabilities, primarily autism. And so th there's her modeling a dress by Olivia, but the one in the middle is uh, a dress that she donated to us that is called the Grace Dress. And they designed that specifically for her. Um, so she donated that to us and there's a few other pieces including her favorite pair of blue jeans which she was didn't want to give up but she she wanted to make sure that we had something that represented who she was and uh something her stock personal style um uh, so this just got uh finalized and she is just an absolute sweetheart of a, of a young woman uh, i believe she's around age 25 and uh it, all, her career started off with um in her being a young adult and she was um, working as a lunch uh, lunchroom attendant at a high school and some of the students um, teased and, and made fun of her and it was a really difficult experience for her and so uh, she decided and it was based on dexterity they were trying to get her to do uh, open up a, a can or something that's difficult when you have um, down syndrome and they knew that and so they were just trying to make fun of her for that so she created a um, presentation that she gives to students um, across the area about uh, how to, about disability, about Down syndrome, what it's like living with that, and and about love and and how people can uh, respect each other. So a really inspiring young woman uh, lives here in the St. Louis area. Uh, so really honored that she was able to donate that collection to us. That's lovely. And then I'm almost to the end of this uh, upcoming projects. Uh, so one is I mentioned the special maid's gowns. Uh, so here's an example of a special maid's gown uh, from 1963. Uh, and it is it looks kind of 
kind of white or silvery in here. It's actually kind of a pale blue color in real life, but it's made by Ann Lowe. And uh, we are going to be loaning this to the Ann Lowe retrospective exhibition that is being put on by the Winterthur Museum in 2023 and right. uh, curated by Elizabeth Way, who is up at FIT, a wonderful person, CSA member. Uh, if you've not met her, you should. She's great and uh, doing this really great, uh, exciting exhibit on uh, Ann Lowe and, and appreciating um, who she was as a designer. Uh, we are lucky enough that we have this dress and one other uh, that were uh, worn by the same woman for her debut year in 1963. That's a fabulous dress. I love the covered buttons as as bunches of grapes. Yes. Yeah, They. It, it's uh, absolutely a, a fantastic example of, of what she was known for. And then the life of kids clothes, tentative title. Uh, so uh, a quick backstory is when I started in 20, uh, in early 2021, I was told the first exhibition that was like big exhibition I can do is in 2028. Well, you can imagine as a curator, I was a little disappointed by that. Um, that is not to say that our collection does not get used. It gets used by pretty much every curator. Uh, so I, we have clothing and textiles throughout the galleries uh, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, but our clothing exhibit schedule is just that far planned out. And this fall, I found out that one of our exhibits had to be pushed back and they were gonna bring in traveling so and I said, wait, wait, don't, don't go so quickly on a traveling show. Let me see if I can pull something together. Uh, and so uh, in June, uh, opening June 3rd of 2023 will be an exhibit on children's clothing. So um, this is something I've actually been developing the idea when I still was in Cincinnati. Uh, and it's something that, you know, children's clothing is just not often the focus of fashion exhibits. Uh, they're yeah. side pieces. Um, and so I really wanted to do that. Uh, we have a brilliant collection here. Uh, I just finished a project with an intern doing, taking reference photos of our kids' clothes and that we were primarily focusing on about 18 month old and up. And that alone, we have over a thousand pieces. And then you would, you add an infant oh clothing. God. Yeah, it's it's a lot. When you add an infant clothing, it's a quite a bit more. Um, so I just wanted to do a few highlights from that. Uh, so we have a cherry dress, which was a mainstay of St. Louis in the 1950s and is still worn today. We have several examples of the cherry dress uh, made, by the, uh, made by the Women's Exchange uh, and, uh, or sometimes homemade. Um, uh, we have this boys ensemble and we have quite a few from these donors. Uh, this was worn by a pair of brothers, Charles and William Bidwell. Charles, both of them were adopted. They were, uh, one was born in 1928, the other in 1931 and were adopted by um, Charles Sr. and his wife, who I, her name escapes me uh, at the moment. Um, but the uh, Charles Sr. was the owner of, they were in Chicago at the time, the owner of the NFL football team, uh, the uh, Cardinals, mm -hmm. and eventually, you know, and then moved to St. Louis when the Cardinals came here. And then uh, Bill, Bid, uh, Bidwell, the son, uh, became the owner uh, upon his father's death. Uh, and Charles Bidwell, the other boy that uh, would have worn this ensemble, became the executive director of Churchill Downs. Uh, oh, well, so you are. Very, very um, in, kind of amazing family. And we have uh, this ensemble. We also have several that are uh, silk ensembles meant for young, you know, 12 to 18 month olds that are very fragile silk made in Vienna. So I don't know how practical they are, but they're beautiful. Uh, so they, they donated quite a bit of their clothing. <laughs> and then my favorite piece. Uh, so I still want to do research, oh, some more research on this. This is a, a, a homemade dress from the 19, early 1960s uh, where the, the girl that wore it designed them. And in our, in our records, it only says characters. Uh, and that's it. We don't know why, what it was used for. I believe they are angels. 
and it may and based on the coloring and, and if they're if I'm right that they're angels possibly like a Christmas pageant or something like that uh I do believe this woman I mean she would have been uh you know born in the uh, mid-1950s so unless something tragic has happened she's I believe is still around and so I'm going to try to see if I can find her and reach out to her uh, and she donated uh, this in 2006, so she was not that long ago, but just some really fantastic pieces. And this is just, has such that's so charming. That's so charming. The exhibition will have kind of standard uh, display types, but we'll also have kind of vignettes um, with it throughout it. So this is kind of an example of what a vignette might look like of uh, a 1930s image of sledding on Art Hill, which is the hill in front of the art museum with a period uh, snowsuit and a period sled. Uh, that gives you a sense these will be on mannequins, uh, fiberglass retail mannequins that give a little bit of sense of body and movement to them. So thank you. Sorry that went so long, but lots to share and talk about. Oh my gosh, you have such an expansive, interesting collection. That's really awesome. Um, thank you so much, Adam. And it must have been such a huge learning curve and is still in the curve of trying to figure out what you have and what you're doing and what that all is since you've been there. Um, okay, so with that, I'd love to open up um, uh, the floor to questions. We have a few. So I'd like to, I'm going to go back and ask a few from the beginning. So the Charles Lindbergh suit, this is uh, a question from the audience. Is the Charles Lindbergh flight suit lined with anything? our viewer has suggested a friend of hers, uh, Barbia Williams, a Dunham trained dancer, uh, you should know. Uh, her company is keeping the tradition of amazing costumes and Afro-Caribbean choreography for black dance alive. And there is a, oh. um, a website that has been shared as well. Thank you very much for that. Regarding the cherry dress, do you know the significance of the cherries? I actually do not. Uh, I was just looking up, there was an article uh, fairly recently in the New York Times about, uh, really it was ultimately about women's exchange groups uh, across the country, but it focused on the cherry dress and, and how that's kind of kept our women's exchange in St. Louis still going. Um, but they still produce, I think the article there said about 450 a year of the cherry dress, of that specifically, uh, that or other types of dresses. but the uh i still need to do research on it that or other another cherry dress will be in the exhibit so i will definitely be doing more research on why the cherries in particular uh were chosen why i mean i think in some ways it may be as simple as they're cute <laughs> right I mean, and actually it's sort of interesting because you've been there now like less than a year so you have so much yet to learn about the regional history and these regional proclivities uh, yep. around dress um, which is awesome but I just want to say thank you Adam this has been fascinating and I am going to propose to I, I have ideas and I'm I, I, we will be visiting I will come and visit you in St. Louis I really yes. want to see this collection this is awesome um, especially the denim collection, but the children's clothes as well. Um, so there, um, there's another really interesting children's collection you should know about, um, actually in at the University of North Dakota in Fargo. They have a few Lawrence Welk things, but they also have a very right. large children's collection. So, um, so you may, it's at a university. So if you are in need of things around the children's wear world, you might reach out to them. Yeah, I have to be careful because I only have 18 months to plan this exhibit. So they're they're pretty much limiting me on too many loans. Uh, of course. And so, but uh, yeah, be be on the look. We're also looking at um, crossing our fingers that we can get this done is a uh, commissioning a children's book uh, to go with this exhibit. Uh, and the, character, the proposed ideas, the characters in the books would be wearing costumes based on the clothes pieces in the collection. 
Nice. And look at uh, play throughout history. That's wonderful. So we're, we're crossing. There's a lot of of things. I, I don't quote me that that will happen in definitively, but that's a hope. But also, like, there is no really great that I'm aware of, and I'm sure somebody in the audience will tell me. Um, but I, children's clothing is so often overlooked or is so very secondary in the in the research disciplines. Um, so I don't know. I can't think of a really good children's book like Raining Man or um, right. any number of the women's wear books out there. Right. I can't think of a great children's wear, children's wear book that is so um, encompassing of historical, yeah. many different historical periods. It's well, usually like, here's a piece and here's a piece and here's a piece. And unfortunately, we won't be able to do a full catalog just because we just don't have the time to do that. But we, it will be, it'll, you know, it will be a children's book in the sense of four children uh, so illust in illustrated, but then also in the back we'll have an appendix with um, uh, photographs of the collection uh, of a selection of that. So it's a really, uh, really great. Well, I mean, one of my favorite pieces is uh, um, late nineteenth century uh, little boy's smoking jacket. <laughs> but, just absolutely. Oh, 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 oh. That sounds great. I love that little red dress with whatever those figures are. I love yeah. that. Those are so yeah, more great. to come on that one. I know, I know. I can't wait. Um, well, um, Adam, thank you so much for your time. And everyone in the audience, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for your questions. Um, so this is our last D&D of 2021. So thank you all for tuning in and for coming. Um, um, and as we say, you know, happy holidays to you all and for whatever holiday you celebrate. Uh, we would like to thank Adam McFarlane for his time and all of you for attending today. So please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure that you hear about all of our upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. And lastly, if you enjoyed today's content, please give generously to make us a donation to help keep our content free for all. Um, the link was posted earlier in the chat, but we can repost it again. And there are more, and here it is in front of you. Um, so with that, uh, Adam, thank you so much. Have a Merry Christmas to you. And yes. go, go enjoy some eggnog. And happy holidays to everyone out there. So thank you so much for attending. And I look forward to seeing you all in 2022. Bye all. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>